Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Cisco SDA training uh, for partner pre-sales engineers. Uh, we're really happy that uh, you could uh, rejoin us. We did have some issues on Tuesday, a few technical issues outside of our control. Um, we've uh, recovered from that and we are now doing part one uh, today and then part two is scheduled for Monday. All of you that have registered or pre-registered uh, should have gotten notices. Uh, obviously, a lot of you uh, are here today, so really, really thank you. Um, this is, again, part one of two. All right, um, we are doing this as a part of the Voice of the Engineer and Tech Talk series. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with those series, uh, we do, uh, first week of the month, we do access switching and mobility. Second week of the month, we do SD-WAN routing. Third week of the month, we do solution uh, driven. Uh, uh, and then this week, we, we reserve the fourth week for uh, special series calls such as this one uh, that we're very happy to, to bring today. So, um, and uh, again, this is happening for all of the um, um, for, for the entire globe. Obviously, it's happening uh, at a time zone that is convenient for those of us here in North America, but uh, the recording will be posted on the partner community, um, and that partner community is um, listed there at the very bottom. That link will take you to a partner community, and uh, there you can find, uh, uh, on, the, on the given date, you can find the link to the content that I will be posting after the call today. So in addition to that, uh, we also uh, put this material on the um, Sales Connect. We actually convert the WebEx recording to an MP4, and we post all the slides on Sales Connect, but that takes a few days to, to, to complete. As a result, we post the content uh, today um, on the partner community just so you have it fresh. Our speakers for today are Salman uh, Asadullah and, um, and Umer Ashad. And this, this webinar speakers, um, you know, Salman is a former Cisco Distinguished Engineer and leads the engineering team at Netnology. Umer is a former Cisco Network Consulting Engineer and now a senior solution architect focused on software-defined uh, networking technologies. Both Salman and Umer are well-known industry experts and Cisco Live Hall of Fame speakers, and we're very, very happy uh, to have them today. Uh, before I hand the ball over to Salman, uh, I just want to remind you that um, uh, some of the logistics for this call, um, our panelists will be from other folks from uh, Netnology and Cisco are on as panelists, and we will be answering the majority of the questions via Q&A panel. At the end of the call, uh, should there be time, uh, we will open it up to, um, to, for you to ask vo uh, verbal questions. Should you have some, please use the uh, WebEx control by raising your hand, um, and uh, we will uh, look to unmute you. My host for today is Joe August, a teammate of mine. Uh, really happy that uh, he could, he's been part of the planning for this series, and we're really happy that he could be with us as well. So with that, Joe, if you could pass the ball over to Salman, and Salman, take it away, sir. Sure, thank you. Perfect, so now I have the ball. You guys can hear me fine? Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Well, um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, uh, wherever you are, because I understand uh, this is sort of a global uh, webinar and people are joining from all over the world uh, so super excited to be part of this series um, and um, basically as uh, Joe um, Vic Nunes just uh, uh, gave us a little bit of introduction uh, so my name is Salman Sadullah uh, one of the former Cisco distinguished engineers I was at Cisco for almost 23 years and then went out and started um, this company in Ethnology. 
Uh, and uh, a good thing is that uh, Vic is also uh, an old friend and colleague, and we have worked together in the past as well. So super excited, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, do this uh, webinar series uh, on behalf of Cisco. Uh, very humbled with that. So, so let me just kind of uh, before getting into uh, some of the the content, I think the way we sort of uh, talked about that, uh, we'll give you a quick overview about our company and then um, uh, get into the content uh, of the uh, webinar. So, if you see, um, we are on the top left corner. We are called Netology, like technology. We are Netology. And we call ourselves a full stack system integrator. And uh, the reason for that is that we are a bunch of CCIs and DevOps automation engineers. So we know how to move up and down in the stack around the APIs, around automation, all that good stuff. And you will see while sort of uh, you must be already working on SDA that it becomes very important to know um, how to kind of automate around the solution, how to use the APIs of the solution. So we kind of bring those skills on the table. On the, the top right corner, we are, uh, you see a couple of uh, logos over there. We are Cisco Integrator Partner and Cisco Learning Partner. Um, so in a one slide, if I want to kind of talk about a little bit about ourselves. So we are, um, this is who we are. And uh, basically, um, as the way I was in Cisco for 23 years, um, uh, most, like I would say 70% of the team members are former Cisco engineers. So we have collectively over 100 years of Cisco experience and purely engineering team with um, uh, a lot of engineering certifications, CCI certifications. Um, and a lot of industry leadership, what we have um, provided while working for Cisco um, in the past. Um, if you see right here, um, you see a lot of these logos and in some of the cases, I think now, I think you will have them, you will recognize a lot of these logos. But mainly we are, we are Cisco from a networking um, vendor, we are mainly a Cisco partner, and then, uh, however, we know how to integrate Cisco solutions with a lot of these logos which you see over here, and that's where that idea of full stack system integration comes uh, into the picture. We are headquartered in San Jose uh, with two um, regional branches in U.S., um, uh, one in Dallas and one in Herndon, Virginia, and that's how we cover coast to coast, and we have an international branch uh, in Dubai. Uh, as I said, uh, as I talked about uh, the leadership and influence, so this is a purely engineering team with a lot of uh, engineering certifications and also numerous industry contributions. So on the right hand side, if you see, um, none of these logos are just there that we attended a conference, not really. Actually, we have contributions to each and every uh, logo which you see over here. So, uh, for instance, uh, any of them you look into it, and um, we have actual contributions to these um, industry you know, platforms. So, I want to take a couple of minutes uh, just to kind of talk about the, the service portfolio because this is what the most interesting piece for you would be that what do we, you know, kind of services we provide. So as I said that we are a Cisco integrator partner, so this is for the partners who do not sell any hardware or software, so we are purely services uh, focused. Uh, so on the left-hand side, these are some of the key services what we provide, professional services, kickstart, mint services, training services, and practice as a service. So. Uh, I think most um, professional services and training services, I think you understand, but Kickstart slash Mint services. So we are among uh, the six global partners for Cisco to provide Mint services, which is mentored installed tra uh, and training services for some cutting edge technologies, including SDA. So if you just do a quick search on Google and say Cisco Mint partners, so you'll see uh, that 
um, uh, our name would be there and what are the mint services are. And mainly it's about, you know, getting, doing the POVs, the mentor installs, um, very focused trainings, uh, pre and post sales uh, for um, some of the cutting edge technologies what Cisco comes up with. And yeah, as you know that I mentioned that we are a training partner, but we are not uh, a, a, a full-fledged uh, uh, big training partners you may have worked with in the past. We do training for very specific uh, technologies we are mastering or focusing on. So actually our trainers are not um, professional trainers. They're actually the de deployment engineers who are deploying this uh, these technologies and architectures and customer uh, environment so they bring all that knowledge while uh, teaching those um, courses and then we also have a concept called practice as a service because we are um, uh, I would say more than 50% of our revenue is, is uh, to help comes from helping the VAR community and the value-added resellers uh, so in some in, uh, when they do not have either the capabilities or the capacity for any of these technologies which we master in, we can you know work with them to sell uh, the so certain packages, uh, a block of hours, um, a virtual headcount, a physical headcount, uh, to help them uh, with the services piece, the deployment piece, the integration piece of all these um, uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. Now on the right hand side, if you really see, uh, this is where you know our key practices are. SD, NFV, data center, and multi-cloud. These are the key technologies what we have. So if you see in the software-defined network fun functions virtualization practice, this is where uh, technology like SDA, so software-defined access would fall in. This is where software-defined VAN um, would fall in, like for instance, Viptela. Uh, then in the data center area, this is where ACI would fall in or uh, Hyperflex would fall in. On In the multi-cloud, um, this is where Cisco Cloud Center would fall in and overall cloud and automation um, uh, technologies, what we focus on and some of the logos you saw in the previous slide. Uh, the way we are Cisco partner, we are also an AWS partner. So we, this is where all the, the these technologies we focus on falls in. Now we believe in uh, the the bottom three boxes. In any of these solutions, we try to automate it, we try to secure it, and we try to do analytics around it. So as an example, that if you're doing um, deploying SDA, because this is session is more focused on SDA. And um, if you do not know ICE, you cannot really deploy a full-fledged um, uh, SDA solution. So this is where our knowledge and expertise of ICE comes in. If you uh, do not know a lot of these automation tools, you can really, uh, you, you won't, will not be able to leverage the power of SDA. So that's where our knowledge of APIs and automation comes in. Uh, if you, um, uh, uh, for instance, uh, from an analytics perspective, things like stealth watch becomes very important. So this is where all this knowledge comes in to, into the SDA piece over here. So the point is that we our focus area across the board when you look into the Cisco's technologies perspective, uh, we ex expertise uh, we are experts of software defined access in campus and branch, software defined van, which is Viptela in the uh, in the van. Uh, and then ACI in the data center area, um, and all the automation integration with the cloud, securing it, doing analytics around it, that's what our uh, bread and butter is. So I will basically um, uh, stop here from an overall company perspective, and I hope you know if you have any other questions, you can always send out an uh, email uh, to myself or at info at netnology.io and we can um, take it from there. Now let's come back to uh, the main purpose of this uh, webinar. So there's one thing which did not get updated here. As you know, uh, um, this is the first um, webinar. So it was supposed to be on 23rd, but because of some technical um, difficulties, what uh, 
Vic talked about uh, we had to cancel it and reschedule it. So this is the, the first webinar uh, of the series of two of them. So before we get into the, the webinar, the content itself, I want to make sure that all the, the folks over here are uh, attending the right webinar or the training because at, at Cisco at any given time, I'm pretty sure there are lots of sessions and trainings are happening. So let's talk about quickly the abstract and why and how did we sort of come up with this whole uh, webinar series and this topic. And this a uh, lot of feedback came from folks like um, Vic uh, on the call and Joe on the call and um, uh, one and only Travis Olam, right? As mo a lot of you know, know know him as well. So these are all former colleagues. And we talked about that, that if you really kind of look into uh, from a partner's perspective, uh, because we're calling it the Partner Pre-Sales Engineer SDA Training, so the partners uh, that we love them to sell Cisco technology and they sell a lot of Cisco technologies, but the reality is that they are, every VAR is a multi-vendor VAR. So their, their pre-sales engineers are also bombarded with a lot of information uh, about a lot of different vendors and stuff. So how do we kind of make sure that, uh, think about the life of a partner pre-sales engineer that who has to juggle between multiple vendors, multiple technologies, and they're always sort of uh, on the hook to provide support to their account teams uh, because they're supposedly our more technical folks, the partner pre-sales engineers. And uh, so how would we provide them just enough information to build a baseline understanding on the SDA solution, have a, a good um, knowledgeable conversation with their customer and that what is this technology is about. Then once um, they talk about the technology, the next thing the customer always asks for, okay, show me how it works, right? Uh, so then basically we have, um, we have built three key demos, which we're gonna kind of uh, show you and help you that how you can also show them. And these are instant demos. So they'll be awesome that it doesn't matter where you go uh, to your customer side, you can quickly access them and show them these three demos, which highlights the key features of uh, SDA technology. And once the customer is happy, then the, again, the account manager calls you and say, hey, help me build the bomb. Uh, and, um, and if there's an opportunity, try to extend the deal and build the SAO as well, right? So these are basically, um, uh, the key areas we have tried to address in that because once you have sort of built the bomb and saw you're pretty much uh, done right now now account team has to make sure that they close the deal because you're juggling between multiple um, uh, of these opportunities so basically uh, if you really see right here it's uh, uh, this training is um, as uh, as I talked about that we are we have built this uh, training um, uh, with a lot of input from Cisco. Even you know some of the content you know we have used from Cisco's the uh, from websites and stuff as well from Cisco Live and everything. Because the goal is how we can make your life easier and how we can help you uh, position well uh, this whole Cisco SDA solution. We are, as I said, we are among the six global um, Mint partners. So we are, you know, doing these uh, SDA deployments uh, day in, day out. Uh, we are among three Cisco uh, BU uh, go-to partners um, who are been helping uh, with SDA deployments and integration for uh, from day one, pretty much. Uh, so we have seen a lot of this, these. Uh, um, things which has happened with the solution and have seen it evolve. So we'll be basically sharing some of those exa um, uh, experiences with you as well as we move forward. And also at the end uh, of this uh, course, uh, we have some really good sort of links um, and references which will help you as a, as a partner engineer to kind of further um, continue to increase your knowledge in this area. Because keep in mind that also, we are calling this a partner pre-sales engineer, but we realize 
team. Um, you know, I used to be even in Cisco, but and then uh, now I'm in a partner role for last uh, almost two years. Uh, the pre-sales engineers in most of the cases are doing both pre-sales and post-sales. And so we have, fo we have done somehow try to get, uh, bring that balance into this training that we give you pre-sales information, but some post-sales information as well. So it'll give you a really good, good understanding to move forward and um, make your time uh, worthwhile to attend this training. So with that, if you're in the right training, good. If you're not, then maybe you want to kind of uh, see that if you're, uh, maybe you want to drop and go join the right training you were uh, scheduled for today. So basically, uh, if you really see uh, the way the agenda of this training is uh, something like this, right? So what we are doing that um, in today's uh, um, webinar, uh, we have said it's up to, to 120 minutes, up to two hours. However, our goal is to kind of end it somewhere around 90 minutes. But we have kept that time just in case. But hopefully we should be finishing it around um, 90 to 100 minute uh, time. Just to kind of, that was the feedback we were getting from Vic and team. Uh, so in the first module, uh, what we'll, we'll talk about the, the, um, the business value, um, uh, and which is basically, if you really see that whenever you're working on any any new solution, there are three things you want to kind of focus on that why you are doing that. So business value talks about why. And then, um, and once you know the why, you want to see, you want to kind of understand what, what factor. So solution overview kind of gives you that what factor. Okay, what is it? Okay, I understand why, now talk about what. And then once you kind of know uh, the what uh, factor now, after that you want to kind of understand what is, how do I do it? So the module three and four basically talks about how. The module three talks about um, the three demos, what we're going to be focusing on, design and provision, segmentation and assurance. And then the fourth module, we're going to talk about, okay, now you have done the demo. Now this is how you're going to build the bomb, which is more around hardware and software. And then SAO, which is more around services. And then in the end, we'll um, close the webinar uh, session in by the key takeaways and references. Now keep in mind that in the first mo uh, webinar today, we're going to have module one, module two, and module three has actually three demos so we're going to cover two of them today and then come back uh, in the second module the second webinar and talk about uh, module three um, the, the the remaining module three which is going to cover the assurance demo and then talk about the 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 module four and five so this is how we have sort of uh, broken it um, and the idea is again um, the whole overall flow of the training so with that um, so now keep in mind that these dates are a little bit you know uh, the slides were uploaded uh, on the 20, uh, 23rd before 23rd so now we are 25th is today and the 29th would be um, on the monday so let's talk about uh, the first module, which is around the business value. So in this uh, module, what we're going to talk about is um, what are the network requirements and challenges and how SDA solves these challenges from a business perspective. So in this uh, first module, uh, let's first of all talk about the overall industry challenges. So it doesn't matter which technology or which vertical or which uh, sector you're looking into, what we have sort of learned that these are the key three areas uh, where customers talk about that these are the their challenges. First one is the cost because the the operational diversity. The second one is the complexity because of the number of endpoint um, devices, and the third one is the risk, right? All the security threats and stuff. 
So when we talk about the cost, for instance, uh, because of operational diversity, there are now a lot of studies has been done where they talk about that overall operational cost is way more than the the capital expenditure, the capex cost. And uh, you will buy a equipment for a certain number of uh, dollars, but when you're going to start operating it, that cost continues to grow because um, everything is being done um, manually. Their things are, you know, they're uh, the way you sort of manage that whole solution is all scattered. Um, there's several touch points which you have to kind of go into and do a lot of these things, and which basically introduces a lot of human error. Um, things are being done manually. There are a lot of ch uh, uh, challenges with the with the troubleshooting and how to kind of deploy it. So these are like common challenges. Doesn't matter which um, solution you talk about. And then uh, the second one is about the complexity, which is coming in from the number of endpoint um, and the type of endpoints you're dealing with. So if you just kind of go back, maybe even a decade ago, um, you had basically, or I would say, yeah, a decade would be a good number. If you go back and you see you used to have maybe a, a one stationary or a little bit over a decade, I would say, uh, stationary machine, um, uh, a computer sitting on your desk, and you would go into work and you would basically, you know, <laughs> just do your uh, work and come back home. And things were uh, very uh, stationary, right? But now, uh, fast forward 10, 15 years later, uh, or I would say even 15, 20 years later, now if you see the whole the number of uh, devices, the endpoints have grown tremendously. If you even look in your own house, for instance, or in your own household, you would see that if you're a family of five, um, you would have maybe you know 15 to 20 endpoint devices. So everybody would have a laptop, they would have an iPad, they would have a smartphone and some other devices and things which are happening based on how um, um, customers um, technology savvy you are so if you really kind of think about from this perspective uh, that basically you are uh, from an IT perspective if <laughs> their people are from uh, they have endpoints or they have customers who are coming in uh, with so many different ways so that also kind of brings that whole uh, brings a lot of complexity uh, then from overall risk uh, perspective you, we are seeing again and again, again and again, that these all these um, ransomware and security threats are growing. And even, you know, uh, this is sort of a well-known fact now that how is, um, even once there is some sort of an issue, it takes months to even recognize that you have an issue. And that's why companies like Cisco, um, they are focusing on when it comes to all of the security and threat stuff, that they're talking about, okay, what needs to be done before um, that that attack happens? What needs to be done during that attack, right? And what needs to be done after that attack? So it's basically it's before it used to be only about, okay, once your uh, the attack has happened, okay, what are you going to do next? Now it's before and during as well, because that during piece becomes very important because it takes enormous amount of time to figure out that you are under uh, attack. So these are overall industry challenges. Now, if you kind of come back to uh, from a networking perspective or traditional networks challenges, they're very similar. Um, and if you see over here that again, there people are talking about complex to manage and difficult to segment uh, and slower issue resolution. So these are, these are some of the key sort of areas what we are looking into. Um, uh, when it comes to the traditional networks perspective. And this is where, you know, I want to kind of take a pause and just talk about uh, a little bit that how uh, the overall, if you see le these three challenges, like I remember when I was still at Cisco um, over a decade ago, this whole idea of SDN started to um, uh, come on the surface. And uh, in fact, Cisco 
had uh, was uh, understood that where the problem is coming from, because the, the, these were pretty much the same uh, areas. Uh, what um, the, uh, the challenges, what customers were talking about, and um, I happened to be at that time uh, uh, was appointed as the co-editor for the migration working group in ONF. And if you remember, Open Networking Foundation came up with this whole idea of um, uh, SDN concept uh, from a, which is again an open source uh, community. And initially, their whole um, goal was that okay, how we can sort of um, separate the control and data plane, and you can use open source devices and white boxes and all that sort of stuff. That was their whole focus. But then, uh, if you really see, uh, ten years later, uh, you do not really hear about all of that stuff. Um, uh, anymore, and this is where I want to kind of take you in that evolution. That how does SDA solve these challenges? What I just talked about. So if you really see that, what really happened in that ten years fast forward, that the vendors started to understand. Okay, these are the challenges. Okay, how we can take some of the good things out of SDN um, concept, where is you know there is some separation of control and data plane. But what were the real challenges? And the real challenges were those three areas. What I just talked to you uh, talk, uh, talked about. So taking those, how we can address those key challenges? How we can make our uh, solution uh, where things are easy to manage? You can have you know more quicker resolution time. How you can have better segmentation? And those are some of the ideas. Uh, Cisco started to plug in into the, its solutions. And even before, as a matter of fact, when we came to SDA, if you remember, Cisco started their SDN journey with the introduction of ACI, um, which was um, in the data center area. And then they started to work on, okay, how we could do the same software-defined concepts, the good things of software-defined concepts in the campus and branch. And that's where, you know, the SD. Uh, access came into the picture, and of course, uh, in the meantime, Cisco also acquired um, uh, two companies, right, Meraki and uh, uh, Viptela, to kind of bring that SDN um, solution options in the van area as well. So, if you really see that uh, you have that end-to-end -end, uh, Cisco uh, SDX solutions. Uh, in each of these uh, network areas, from campus and branch to van to data center. So, coming back to the SD access, right? So the SD access, as the name is, the software defined access. So if you really see that the idea of this whole F software defined access is that Cisco claims that this is basically the first intent based networking solution for the enterprise, which is built on the principles of Digital network architecture DNA, which is actually is uh, some of the key components of SDN and NFV. So if you remember, I haven't even talked about NFV, the network functions virtualization. That the idea of having VNFs, the virtual network functions, you will see that even in SDA is heavily used. That there are a lot of things you could virtualize and run as functions. So now, if you really see what really happened, even in this picture over here. That you have that you know the DNA center over here, which is basically, if you see from the SDN world perspective, that is your controller, because that is um, where a lot of smartness is there, right? You you this is where the control plane information is there, the management information is there, the orchestration information is there, and if you remember from the SDN days, there was an idea of. Uh, Three different type of SDN controllers: a total separation of control and data planes. All the smartness was in the controller. Then there was the idea of hybrid um, uh, model, which is basically most of the uh, um, smartness is in the controller, but there's some smartness still exists in the endpoints as well. And this is where the Cisco's um, uh, an overall industry kind of went with that not total separation of control and data plane, uh, some separation of control and data plane, and actually focusing on addressing the the real customer challenges, and which is basically listed if you see on the right hand side over here, that how we can provide the identity based policy segmentation, uh, 
uh, network uh, automated fabric and inside and telemetry. So if you really see that all of the solution, even if um, um, if you kind of look into these three areas, that's where we're going to be focusing on building this knowledge for you, being a pre-sales engineer. These are going to be the areas uh, where you will have uh, the demos are be, going to be um, uh, be shown to you. This is where you're going to be building this whole um, the sow and the bomb around this uh, uh, these um, key areas. And if you really see, uh, if I want to kind of you know kind of talk about a little bit, take a a quick uh, um, overview on each of these areas for you. So let's look into first of all the automated network fabric so the the automated network fabric is um if you really see what happened in the it world that the the it managers always complain about that they have to set policy for wired and, and then for wireless now with sda well, not only does the policy you set follow the user it provides consistent management across wired wireless throughout a single fabric for campus-wide roaming and simplified provisioning so if you really see that this is what was happening before sda on the left hand side box right so you had to repetitive policy work for wired and wireless layer 3 domain roaming issues you are if you're looking into these points you say oh yeah that's totally on a target and after sda uh, with deploying SDA, this is what's really happening, that you have that consistent uh, management across wired and wireless. You have seamless roaming and optical optimal uh, traffic flows. And basically, roaming in fabric and non-fabric domains are seamless. And this is what we're going to show you in some of the demo, demos as well. So just to kind of building upon the story, this would be your uh, demo number one uh, once we kind of get into the module three. Then uh, looking into the second uh, key area, identity-based identity policy and segmentation. So what really happened as networks um, got more complex, it's cumbersome to get devices and users onboarded on the right network with right credentials seamlessly. So we were hearing this you know, all along. But today, uh, we live in a CLI-driven world that allows us to define consistent policy but just once right and if you had to make any changes you had to go and do that all over again now with sda uh, you can associate a policy to a specific groups with no dependency on vlans and ip addresses okay this is a key thing over here now you can also define one consistent policy that will that and that policy basically follows the user from the edge to the cloud and better yet, you don't have to deal with policy violations and errors manually. And this is what we are, as a, uh, uh, initial uh, services only partners, working with the BU, working with some of the, helping the VARs, helping with some of the customers, we are seeing all of these things in action. So if you really see that this is what's happening before SDA, the things what I just talked about, and now with SDA, you have basically these are the, the advantages you're getting and this is going to be shown in demo number two and you'll have enough knowledge to talk about this to your con uh, customer and demo this uh, capability the third key area uh, last but not least which is a very key area is the insights and the telemetry so sda provides analytics and telemetry information to monitor and improve network health because from get go from day one this was uh, the first uh, you know easy to manage and have the visibility and all that sort of stuff so that was the key uh, one of the key goals and that's how we ended up in these three areas so the information they collect and provide significantly reduces troubleshooting time and helps uh, uh, the, the that specific um, IT team or the leadership team make informed decisions so because they'll have it's not about just making random decisions they'll have enough data to make okay what extensions needs to be done what 
new sites needs to be deployed, how much investment we need to do, all of that data, they'll have it available so they can make very informed decisions. And all the information in, uh, is basically in the, is aggregated into a single platform. Uh, you don't need to look at various separated chunks anymore while troubleshooting an issue. Everything exists on one platform. And what is that one platform? I'm not even going to say that, right? You should know it by now. That is basically the DNA center. So if you really see, this is what was going on before. And now this is with the deep insights and telemetry. This is what's after SDA happens. And this is where um, the demo number three would be, which will be part of the, the, the webinar number two on Monday. So with that, um, another important um, uh, sort of study I would like to share with you that the whole idea of the SDA um, is to give time back to, the, to IT. And this is where a, a very interesting study which Cisco did with uh, McKinsey, uh, where they said, okay, with, tell us, you know, before SDA, after SDA, how it's really making a difference. And this, these numbers kind of tells you uh, that um, how the solution really makes a difference. That this is, uh, you know, I'm not gonna talk about this slide. This is very um, uh, powerful sort of numbers which tells you that how, you know, it's helping the overall addressing the key challenges. So it's evolving from a decade ago idea of SDN, separate the, the control and data plane, get white boxes, get open source software to really addressing to the real customer need. So in summary, in this module, what we have talked about is the overall network requirements and challenges and how SDA solves these challenges by giving you three specific examples or e building the story for you when you talk to your end customers about those three key areas. And of course, in the following modules, you're gonna, because right now, think about, we're talking about why, right? Now from module two, module three, and module four, in fact, let me take it back. Module two would be about what, because that's where um, I'll hand over to Omer, who will talk about the key components of um, the SDA solution. And so how to, to you start building that knowledge, the enough knowledge to do those demos and have a good, decent conversation with your customers. And then of course, in module three and four, we're gonna talk about how. So with that, um, um, sure, so I just, spoke a little bit sooner. So this is where the, the module two, we, um, the solution overview. This is where uh, I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Omer, one of my uh, colleague. Again, um, uh, Vic talked and gave a quick um, overview or the introduction for uh, for him as well. Uh, Omer is a, is a dear friend and uh, we have been, you know, used to work together in Cisco and the same team and stuff. and. Now we are working here at Netnology. And um, so he'll get into the solution overview, talking about the key components to enough level of details that you can do those demos with a lot of confidence. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we'll get into the how piece uh, following that module. So with that, uh, Omer, I'll pass it on to you and uh, basically uh, take it from here. Thank you. So I think Joe, if you can make uh, Omer the presenter now, please. Omer, you are muted, sir. Thank you. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Wit. Thank you, Joe. In the first module, Simon talked about basics 
for FDA? Why FDA? What value it brings to the table? Why should we move toward an FDA access environment? In this module, we're going to talk about what is FDA. And Wick or Joe, how would I advance the slides? It seems like I'm unable to advance the slides. Yeah, maybe you have photos on the left side of the screen of the slide. You have, uh, or you can just put focus on the slide and use your arrow keys. Got it. So in this module, we're going to talk about what is SDA, what are the different components of SDA, how all those components come together to make it an SDA access environment. We'll look at how the campus design evolved in the last 30 plus years since networking came into being. Cisco was the founder for that. Then we're going to look at overview of the SDA solution. We'll jump into main SDA components, what those components are, how and why those components are used, and then we are going to tie everything together and wrap it up with an SDA design how a design would look like once we combine everything together. If you look at this slide deck, we took it from one of the Cisco Life presentations. This is a very interesting slide. On the bottom left, we have physical topologies that have evolved over the course of last 30 plus years. On the top, we have the logical topology. We all started with layer two networks. Our access layer is going to be purely layer two. Our distribution layer is going to be a mix of layer two, layer three, and then we would have the core layer. And then we will do the protocol tuning to make sure things align, things gel together pretty good. We don't have a spanning tree loops. We don't have any kind of routing loops to make sure everything, everything works fine. Then came along layer three routed access where we extended our layer three boundary all the way down to the access layer. We converted our layer two switches at the access layer into pure layer three switches. And we said, okay, now we can bring our routing all the way down to the access layer. That will take care of a spanning tree. Again, all of this is still hand driven, prone to human errors, policies that humans define. There can be mistakes. Then came along new evolution technologies such as VSS, virtual switching system. Stack-wise virtual with Catalyst 9Ks. We had other means of simplifying the technology and the topologies for the environment where we would still have layer two at the access layer. Distribution will be a combination of layer two, layer three, and then we will have the core devices. However, when we get to that point, our logical topology would be more simpler. It would look like as if our access and distribution are connecting to one core device in reality, which is basically either a VSS or a stack-wise virtual or some other means by which we have combined different devices to make them look like one common device to, to, to the downstream devices in the network. Again, so far, everything is being done by hand, prone to human errors, policy that humans define, have to do a lot of work. These kind of network designs can take weeks, if not months, to implement. Comes along, troubleshooting, inconsistent policies, challenges, how things are working because someone might have a policy on router A, someone might have a different policy on router B. This all came to the concept of how we can provide a consistent user experience while making sure the networks become more high available, more resilient. If you look on the extreme right, the topology is very simple. If you look at the physical topology, extremely simple, not much of a change. However, the biggest difference is the logical component. We are creating a fabric. We are putting everything inside a fabric here in this topology to tie everything together, to use a DNA controller here 
to make sure our policies are consistent across the board. Make sure our security is consistent across the board. Make sure user experience is consistent across the board. Now, let's look more deep into the intent-based networking. Now we talked about, okay, we are looking to build the fabric. Sounds great, sounds amazing. What is the intent? Cisco is using the term intent-based networking. What is intent-based networking? And intent-based networking is basically saying that there is a network as a single system which is providing the translation and validation of business goals into the network that returns actionable insights. Now, if we expand on this definition real quick, when we say actionable insights, we are pointing to telemetry and assurance very easily. When we talk about network, this is where the segmentation piece comes in, the design piece of the networking comes in. When we talk about a single system that provides the translation and validation of the business goals, we are talking about provisioning the devices, creating the policies with the help of ICE, making sure users get a consistent experience across the board. Salman talked about everything used to be hand-driven a couple of decades ago. Fast forward to 2019, everything is digitally transformed. Every household has multiple devices, tablets, smartphones, multiple laptops, desktops, smart TVs, smart refrigerators. Healthcare industry is moving more towards everything being digitally transformed. We don't have to go to an ER if one of our child is sick at nighttime. We can just call the doctor, get on a video conferencing call with doctor, they look at the child, prescribe the medication, done. We don't have to make a trip to the emergency room. Now, let's talk about how this all comes together. I did mention fabric. I have used this word a couple of times already in my last three slides, fabric. How are we building the fabric? What is fabric here? When we say fabric, what are we trying to explain here? Fabric is nothing. When we define an overlay network, fabric brings everything together. Fabric is what is tying all the components together. If there's one slide in the whole webinar, which is probably the most important slide, is this slide, which is right here on the screen. We all have known and worked with underlayer networks for the last couple of decades. We all have used VLANs. We all have used MPLS network. We all have used OTV. We all have used technologies like Lisp. What are those technologies? Overlay. Now talk about underlay. There are two components to building the fabric, an underlay and an overlay. When we talk about underlay, underlay is nothing more than having a network which is running either EIGRP, OSPF, BGP, or any other means of providing end-to-end -end connectivity. When we put MPLS on top of it, it becomes an overlay network. MPLS makes it an overlay network, meaning a logical network that is running on top of a physical network. It would be nice to have a fully meshed physical network every single time. It is not possible. There are geographical limitations, money, revenue. If a company has a footprint across the world, it's impossible to have a full mesh network. Even if a company has a footprint only in one state, it will be very challenging to provide a full mesh because the fiber, fiber runs are going to be extremely expensive. Concept comes in, overlay. How you can build a logical network on top of the physical network. This is the basis for having an SDA network. This is the basis on which as the architecture is built. And we'll get into more details on the protocols and the components that make up 
the overlay. Here we are showing some of the devices which are DNA aware. In order for us to build the fabric, we have to make sure the devices that we are positioning in front of the customer, whether it, it is for the wide infrastructure, it is for the wireless infrastructure. We have to make sure they are DNA aware. We cannot just go in and sell a 3750 X switch to your customer and think, oh yeah, DNA will, uh, we can build fabric on top of it. No, the devices have to be DNA aware. We have a link in the bottom here, Cisco SDA access ordering guide, which has a list of all the devices which are SDA compatible and DNA aware for both wired and wireless devices. It also provides recommendations on to what code versions that Cisco recommends when building the fabric. It is extremely important to follow those guidelines. As I said, I cannot just go in and sell a random device to my customer and expect it to become part of the SDA fabric. It will not work. So it is extremely important to understand what customer needs are, what customer goals are, what are the bandwidth requirements, what is the traffic profile, what they're looking to do, build a bomb based on their needs and requirements, and make sure those devices are DNA aware. We're going to talk more about this in my module four once we get into second webinar. Now let's look at some of the SDA components. Again, as I said, this is the key. To understand the components. If you see here on the diagram, we see a lot of different pieces here. We see an edge node, we see an intermediate node, we see a control node, we see a fabric wireless, we see DNA center, a lot of different things that we see here on the diagram. What we are trying to show here, how the fabric comes together. All these components which are shown on the screen, they make up the fabric. All these components make up the fabric. What we are seeing here on the diagram is how these components interact with each other. As we go into subsequent slides, we're going to look at what these individual components are what their roles are, and how they interact when they're inside the fabric. Everything comes together. Again, I will repeat. I have said this before in my previous slides. Everything comes together by the fabric. All these individual components that we are seeing on the screen, they become part of the fabric. An individual component cannot make a fabric on its own. DNA, Cisco DNA Center, is where everything comes together. Cisco DNA Center is from where we build the fabric, we tie everything together. It's basically like a team of devices that we bring together to create a hierarchy, to create a model. An individual device, an individual component would not do anything here. It would just function as a regular device. If you look at the very first component, Cisco DNA Center, there are three important things about Cisco DNA Center that I want everyone to remember. The very first thing is security. When we talk about security, every user, every organization, every manager, director, VP, every executive in every company we spoke to, we all know the very first thing they ask, okay, I understand you are going to implement a cutting edge technology. How are you going to secure my network? A lot of times we know cutting edge technologies come out, the missing component, security. No one thinks about it. People don't look at security. People miss that part. Security is an integral component of SDA solution, of the SDA fabric. You can build a fabric without ice, no doubt about that. If you want to go ahead and build a fabric without ice, yeah, that's fine, you can build it. You will not be able to provision any, any of your virtual networks. You will not be able to create any of your SGTs. 
You will not be able to create any of your policies. You will not be able to secure the environment and provide any security assurance to your customer that, Mr. Customer, yes, I have deployed SDA and your network is secure. It is just like building a fabric with nothing. The second component, automated network fabric. The NA builds the fabric. As I said before, all these components are individual components. They don't mean anything until, unless DNA brings them together. That is the beauty of Cisco DNA. It brings everything together. DNA is the main component that is bringing everything together. Last piece, insights and telemetry. Of course, we have deployed the solution. We have a controller DNA, which is integrating itself with ICE, integrating itself with wireless and controllers integrating itself with NTP servers, all that jazz, amazing, fine, great. What about my insight? How would I manage it? What if something is happening in my network? How would I know? What if something is about to happen? How would I know? Where would I get the notifications? How would I know my traffic profile? How would I know where my devices are connected? How would I know if I'm tracing a host somewhere in my fabric? How to reach out to that host? Telemetry and assurance, it provides those capabilities. Once we have the demo, we are going to demonstrate how you can troubleshoot some of the issues, both for the wired and the wireless users, how you can trace path, how you can see the stats and how DNA creates stack cases automatically for you when there is an issue happening. ICE. I think we have talked about ICE enough. We have emphasized enough on ICE, its role, its importance. When we integrate ICE, and when we are creating policies, all those policies that we create on DNA, Cisco DNA, they will get pushed to ICE. And from ICE, they will get pushed to the rest of the users in the environment or to the networking devices. This provides a consistent user experience because now we are pushing all of the policies from one common platform. A user is not going in. I'm not going onto a CLI for 50 devices inside my fabric and copy pasting the commands every single time. I'm not doing it. I'm creating my policies from DNA. I'm creating my contracts from DNA. I'm creating my group-based access list from DNA and having ICE push all of those policies. I can go into my ICE, I can look at my matrix to see how everything looks, what my security policies are. REST, DNA and ICE are going to take care of everything. They will be pushing all of my policies that we are creating to all of the devices inside my fabric. Now you see the immediate value. If we have to go, if we have a fabric, or if we have a network of 50 devices, for instance, we have to go and implement the same security policy on all those 50 devices, how much time will it take? Versus you create your policies in Cisco DNA, you integrate that, it is integrated with ICE, it is getting pushed out to all of those 50 devices in no time. Look at, imagine the time saving, imagine the consistency and the user experience one of the key components, consistency. Consistency is the key. We all know a lot of times the network issues don't happen because of major routing issues. They don't happen because of some major attacks. They happen because of small things that we all forget as humans. When we are pushing a policy, we are copying the configs, we are creating the configs, maybe we missed something in there, something minor in there, which creates an out of compliance experience. A lot of financial customers, they have to go through audits. A lot of federal customers, they have to go through federal audits. When auditors come, come and sit with you, they're extremely hard on those security policies. They're extremely hard on compliance. This is what provides consistency and compliance.
fusion router. The router in the top center in dark blue is the fusion router. Now, what is a fusion router? A fusion router is just a router that is sitting north of the fabric. What is its role? What is fusion router doing? When we create fabric, DNA, Cisco DNA is going to create a multi-protocol BGP and it is going to push configs out on the border nodes. We have to go to the fusion router and we create the BGP neighbors so that traffic can flow. That is the role of a fusion router. Now, depending on the organization needs, if an organization has a need for end-to-end -end VRF, then we would have to extend our VRF into the fusion router. If an organization has the services in the global routing table outside of the fabric, we just create a simple multi-protocol BGP with a fusion router and we are on our way. Fusion Router is a component which is not managed by DNA. If we have a Catalyst 9K, if a device which is DNA aware, DNA will know about it. However, DNA is not going to push configs to the Fusion Router, those BGP configs. When we are creating the border node, DNA will create the config at the border node that we will take and we are going to apply the configs ourselves on the Fusion Router. DNA will not apply the configs on the Fusion Router today. Now the next component, pretty important component, control plane nodes. On the top right in dark blue right now, if you guys see. Now what is a control plane node? So what control plane node is doing, it is basically tracking all of the users and devices as they attach themselves to the fabric and as they roam around. Most of us have used technology such as VXLAN. What VXLAN does? We build a VXLAN environment. If a user on switch one, or if, a, if the same user moves to switch five, it does not matter. That roaming is seamless. With the control plane, we are tracking the users as they move around. It basically allows the network components to look at the database to determine where the user is attaching itself to the fabric. I did talk about how would I see if a user that was on switch one now is on switch two. He might be on floor one this morning. Now he's probably on floor two. If I have to go and track that user, I would do it from Cisco DNA. That's what control plane is doing. It is tracking. It has that tracking enable that tracks the location where users are moving, where the information is, and provides a seamless experience to the users. Border nodes, the two devices in the center with capital B. What is border node doing? If we have to look at it in simple terms, a border node is providing access to the outside world. It is the gateway for all the traffic going out into the world, coming back into the fabric. It is connecting us to the traditional environment, traditional legacy layer three network. Or if we have multiple fabrics, we use border node to connect to multiple fabrics. Now, when we look at border nodes and the control nodes, at times we can combine them. Depending on the customer requirements and needs, border nodes and control nodes can be combined together or they can be kept separated. It depends on the customer needs and requirements. Again, this is where having a conversation with the customer comes up, making sure customer understands the role and function of each component. What is a border node? What is a control plane node? What functions are they doing? Can we combine the functions? Absolutely, yes. Because control plane node is using LISP. It is tracking the devices as they move around. If we have a big enough uh, device with a big enough horsepower, we can certainly combine border node and control plane functions onto the same devices. Edge nodes. Now, if we 
look at the edge nodes. They're nothing different than an access layer switch. It is literally an access layer switch where the end users and end hosts are connecting. If my customer is asking me, okay, Mr. Omer, when you're going to create the fabric, what do you mean by edge node? How is it different from what I'm doing today? In reality, it's not. At the physical layer level, it is not. I was connecting to an access layer before, and I'm connecting to an edge node. An edge node is nothing but an access layer switch. It's still connecting the end users. Now, what it is doing though, it is the first point where users would connect and where we implement our policies. If we have to push dot one X for the wide ports, we, and we do it, ICE is going to push all those policies. This is the first point where those kind of policies get implemented. If we are, for instance, creating multiple, if we want to provide users a seamless experience, this is where that happens. If a user moves from edge node one on the bottom left of my screen to the edge node four on the bottom right of the screen, that experience would remain seamless because we are stretching the subnets across the domain with the help of VXLAN technology. That's what we are doing. We, are, we have introduced the concept of virtual tunnel endpoints. For a lot of us, it's not a new concept, concept because we have used VXLANs in the past. We have used VXLAN in ACI world as well. So it's not a new concept to a lot of us, but this is exactly what it is happening. Now let's talk about the wireless. A lot of questions on wireless. People think, okay, this all is good. I understand how my wide infrastructure would work. Now the question is, what about my wireless infrastructure? How would I provision that? How would I make it work? First thing, if customer wants to have the wireless line controllers, fabric enable, they have to have the access points and wireless line controllers. DNA aware, they have to have the right amount of licenses. Because you cannot just, again, as I said, you cannot just bring a device into the fabric and think it would be, become part of the fabric and it would work. When we create a fabric enabled wireless or fabric enabled wireless line controller, all of the access points that are attached to the wireless line controller, they would automatically come with the wireless line controller. They will get provisioned by DNA as well. All of the SSIDs that we would create, network profiles that we would do, we would do it inside Cisco DNA at that time. There are different modes available. If an organization already have a wireless line controller, they can run it, run it as over the top. Most of the time recommendation is, if you have a fabric for the wide users, it makes sense to have your wireless line controller fabric enabled as well. Now let's look at some of the SDA design components, how we start, what we do there. The very first thing we have to sit down with the customer and understand is the environment. There is a concept called virtual network segments. What is a VN segment? It is nothing different than a VLAN. We all have been using VLANs for the past 30 plus years. We all use and create multiple VLANs. We put phones in one VLAN, we put employees in another VLAN, we put printers in a third VLAN, we put IoT devices in the fourth VLAN, so on and so forth. Same concept applies here. It is just the next evolution of it. Understand what customer requirements are. How do they want segmentation? What policies do they want us to implement? What are their goals? What kind of an outcome they're looking for once the fabric is designed and is built? What are their expectations? Ask all these questions to your customers and understand what the end goal is. Create a picture, connect the dots together. 
understand how the network is currently set up today. With SDA fabric, the underlay has to be layer three. We cannot have a layer two network that can become part of the SDA fabric. The network has to be layer three network for underlay. We cannot have edge nodes connected to each other. Very important point. A lot of people miss this point. The edge nodes, they cannot connect to each other. They cannot be daisy chained. The edge nodes can only connect north bound in SDA fabric. And these are all important steps to understand because a lot of times customer networks, they have daisy chained. They have access layers connecting to each other because they ran out of ports and now they've connected devices to each other. They created port channels between the edge nodes to make sure they have HSRP implemented, VRRP implemented, and they can try users. There are certain aspects that we need to follow. Validate the bill of material with the customer. Understand what hardware and software do they have in the environment? Do they need to upgrade their hardware? Or if they have the right amount of hardware, do they have to go to a newer code release? For instance, if they already have ICE implemented, ICE version is 2.2 they would need to go to a newer code version so that it can be integrated with the fabric. Understand all those details. Understand the customer requirement and environment. Understand what kind of licenses do they have. In order for all of the devices to be part of the fabric and DNA wear, they have to have certain licenses, such as DNA Advantage. Understand, do they have those licenses or not? Make them understand what benefits or repercussions would be if they only have the base licenses. What will work, what will not work. Understand the IP schema. If customers are looking to build SDA fabric in one part of the network and looking to integrate that part of the environment with the legacy network, make sure the IP subnets they assign are non-overlapping. Very important point. The IP subnets that they should be assigning to the fabric, there must be non-overlapping IP subnets. We cannot have an overlapping IP subnet in the fabric and in the traditional world. It will create and cause issues. And lastly, of course, very important piece, understand the timelines. Make sure customer has the right expectations based on everything that are highlighted on the top that will help you define the project start date and when you can expect to finish the project. Design. Before moving on, I will be fairly honest. The first slide that I talked about looks very good. We, we talk to the customers, we explain them what we are gonna do, customers get excited, they get on board, yes, do it, do it tomorrow, do it today, let's get it done. But when you start doing the implementation, then the real fun begins. A lot of times we are asked, okay, why are we doing this? We don't remember this. We did not discuss this. Make sure we are creating a high level design document with the diagrams, with the traffic flow, so that the customers can understand and realize once the fabric is built, what will be the different components that will be part of the fabrics? What protocols will be running as an underlay? Where will the shared services reside? How the physical connectivity would look like? In one of the instances, I will share real-time experience. In one of the instances, one of the customers had their shared services and they said, I want my shared services to be inside the fabric. No, you cannot do it. It's a big no-no. We cannot do this. So understand and set the right expectations. And HLD is a great way to do it because it captures everything that has been discussed in customers' requirements. When we had on-site meetings, planning sessions, it captures everything. It captures the traffic flow. It captures the current state of the network and the future state of the network. Make sure, capture all those details. Make sure customer understands how the network would look like moving forward, what capabilities it would have, and what it would do for them. Very important piece, very, very important piece. Again, 
when we come to underlay, a lot of customers are still running EIGRP. For our underlay to work, it has to be the OSPF or ISIS. OSPF can be done manually. With ISIS, there are two options. Either it can be configured manually or it can be configured with the help of PNP operation. When a switch comes out of the box, we provision the box, and here we go. It comes up. We pick one seed device. We do the discovery. A new device comes up, does the PNP operation. Seed device will configure all of the devices inside the fabric. Very easy process. Make sure customers understand. A lot of times, customers are not familiar or they're not comfortable moving to OSTF or ISI because they have been using EIGRP for such a long time. Make sure they feel comfortable. They understand once it's done, it is only for an underlay. It will not communicate to the outside world. Underlays do not communicate to the outside world. They stay inside the fabric. Once the traffic hits the border, this is where we have BGP and list being redistributed into each other. And that sends all the traffic downstream. The underlay network, whether OSPF or ISIS, no one sees that in the outside world. Outside world has no knowledge about there is an OSPF running as an underlay or there is an ISIS network running underlay. So it's a one-time thing. Whether do it via PNP operation, do it manually, both options work fine. So here, here are some diagrams, some screenshots that we have taken to show how we are creating the network settings. If you see it on the top, we have design, policy, provisioning, assurance. Each tab has its own meaning. When we start implementing things from DNA, we start with the design. The very first step is we create a site hierarchy. Whether we are in North America, we are in Europe, we are in Asia, we are in Australia, or somewhere else. Which state are we in? We might be in Virginia, we might be in California, we might be in Texas, we might be in Illinois. Within those states, where are we? We might be in Chicago, we might be in San Jose, we might be in Dallas. Within those locations, where is the actual campus? It can be in Rosemont, Chicago. It can be in Plano in, in Dallas. It can be in Santa Clara in San Jose. Create the hierarchy, very important piece. Because a lot of, I can assure everyone, when a customer gets on his DA, this hierarchy is the key. Because they will not be using DNA only for one site. It is very likely, and almost 100% of the cases that we have seen, customers would like to expand it to other locations as well. So have the right hierarchy. Make sure they understand the meaning of hierarchy and they do it properly. ICE integration. I think we have emphasized enough on it why ICE integration is so critical. Once the DNA comes up, integrate ICE right away before starting anything, if you can. This is the key. Once ICE is integrated, it will help create the policies. Because the policies cannot be created without ICE being integrated into DNA. Whether it is a cluster of ICE nodes or it's a single ICE node, they both would integrate with DNA fine. If we have a cluster of ICE nodes, once we integrate the PAN node, all of the PAN and the PSN nodes would automatically show up in DNA. discover the network. As I said, DNA will go out and discover the network. However, if you only manage devices, which are DNA aware, to understand the customer physical topology and customer environment is the key. Understand what devices can be part of the fabric, which devices will be the access layer devices, which devices will be the border node devices. Make recommendations properly. The SDA matrix, the SDA compatibility matrix that I shared earlier in my slide deck, it has recommendations as to whether we support or whether we recommend 9300 as the edge node or the border node, whether we recommend 9500 as the border node or as the edge node. 
It has all the recommendations. So make sure, follow along. Make sure, look at the compatibility matrix. Make sure, understand the customer traffic flow and make proper recommendations. Identify the IP subnet needs. As I said, we all have been using VLANs and curating VLANs for a long, long time. This is not new. The difference is we are creating virtual networks now. When we are saying employee data, this is my virtual network. This is a separate virtual network and it will get translated to a VLAN on the edge node. My employee phone, this subnet will become part of a VLAN that DNAC will create and push. On the DNA, we are calling it a virtual network. On the edge node, it will become a VLAN. Similarly for guest, LAN automation, building control, they all will become VLANs on the edge node. One very important point to mention here, DNA creates VLAN numbers randomly. And those numbers are created above 1000. DNA will not create VLANs two, three, four, five, six, no. It will create VLANs starting in 1000 something or 2000 or 3000 something. Make sure don't change those VLANs numbers. We had customers who were not happy. We had customers who tried to change the VLAN numbers without letting us know, and it broke the environment. Once DNA creates a VN segment, it pushes out those VN segments to the edge nodes, it creates those VLAN numbers, don't change it. Make sure customers understand not to make any changes. It is not recommended to make manual changes on the CLI if we don't have to, once the fabric is up and running. Our priority, our preference, our recommendation is to make sure we leverage DNA as much as possible. If something doesn't make sense, go to Cisco TAC. They are the experts. They are there to help out. Don't convert this into a science project, to be honest. Yeah, if we are doing a proof of concept with the customer, probably fine in a limited deployment scope or in a production environment, in a brownfield migration, make sure customers understand the significance of those virtual networks, which will get, which will get pushed to the edge nodes as the access VLANs and why they should not be changing the numbers. Very important piece, very, very important piece. Fusion router, as I discussed, Fusion router is a router that sits northbound of the border node, understand the customer requirements, do they have a need to have end-to-end -end VRF in their environment? If yes, we would extend VRF into the Fusion Router. If they don't, if they have all of their shared services sitting in the global routing table, they have all of the IoT devices, printers, other equipment or other pieces of technology all reside in the global routing table, just extend multi-protocol BGP to the Fusion Router from border, create sub-interfaces on the Fusion Router, create a BGP, create neighbors, and that's it. Again, that would come from the customer discussions. When you sit down with the customers, understand the network hierarchy, understand the network topology and design, and then we move forward. Wireless and controller provisioning, as I said, when we bring a wireless and controller, such as 9800 series, uh, these are the virtual wireless and controllers, we provision them, we integrate them. Every device that we bring up Keep in mind, it has to be provisioned into the DNA fabric. It has to be assigned to a site or to a building or to a campus in order for DNA to know and track that. What we are showing here on the screen is how we provision a wireless LAN controller. Once it is provisioned, assigned to a site, we push it out to the environment. And this is what we're gonna see in the demo as well. Once we get to the design and the segmentation piece, how that would happen. So when we, once we create a building, a campus hierarchy, we provision the device, we assign it to the site, we apply the changes. And it will get pushed out auto immediately. Or we can pick a maintenance window time. When do we want to push out those changes? Provision the access point. As I said, when we integrate wireless into DNA fabric, 
if we had access points which are DNA aware, connected to the virus and control, they will become part of the fabric. In order for them to be functional, to be truly integrated with the fabric, we would have to do the same thing with them as well. We would have to provision them. We would have to assign them to the floor. The key differentiator here is access points getting assigned to the floor. In order for access points to be integrated and provisioned, they must be assigned to a floor. Wireless line controller can be assigned to a campus. Access points, they must be assigned to the flow level. If we have 10 access points, make understand where those access points are, which floor every access point is, and assign them accordingly. Create flows in your design, in your hierarchy. Let's summarize what we discussed. We talked about the design evolution, how design evolved from layer two to layer three to technologies such as VSS, stackwise virtual, to SDA fabric. We looked at SDA as a whole. What is SDA? What is DNA? How they both function together? What is fabric? We looked at all of the SDA components. What is a border node? What is a control node? How an edge node is different from an access layer switch? What is a fusion router? What is a fabric enabled wireless line controller? What are the devices which are DNA aware? And then we looked at how all these pieces come together. Keep in mind what I said before, all of the individual components are nothing unless they come together. DNA ties everything together. DNA creates the fabric. DNA is what brings everything together. Without DNA, you can have a campus. Your fabric would not be there. Now let's talk about module three. In module three, what we're going to look at is how we are going to demo the solution. If your customer is looking for a quick demo, how we go to dCloud, what are some of the demos which are available on dCloud, and what capabilities do they have? In today, today's demo, the very first demo, we're going to talk about design. We're going to create a hierarchy. We're going to provision a wireless line controller. And we're going to see the process, how it works. The second demo is going to talk about segmentation. Segmentation is nothing but creating the policies. When we go to the policies section, this is where we create our virtual networks. And we are going to show an example of how we can do a micro and a macro segmentation. In third demo, we're going to talk about assurance. Remember what we talked about, insights and telemetry. Everything is functional, everything is working, but I want to see how it is working. We're going to see how assurance helps us track and monitor how everything works. So today we're going to talk about the design and provision demo. We're going to go to dCloud, Everything is available in dCloud. So we go to dCloud and we're going to start our demo from dCloud, basically. So I'm, with that said, Rick, I'm going to share my screen because I have to go to dCloud. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, please do. And just, uh, just doing a time check, we're 36 uh, minutes after the hour. Um, so keep yes. going. Thank we are you. going to yeah we are going to talk about the design demo today, and we're going to stop at design uh, demo today. Here we go. So when we go to dCloud, I'm already in dCloud right now. I go to dCloud, and this is the demo that you all want to. Look, out, look for Cisco DNS Center Automation and Assurance Demo for Partners. I'm going to click on the demo. It is going to break up instructions. It is going to show me all the resources. These are all the different use cases. I'm going to open up our first one of the use cases that we're going to look at. You can save it. I already have it on my machine, so I'm just going to use from a machine. 
and then we are going to go to view. Username to log in is demo. Password to log in is demo 1234 asterisk. Not asterisk, sorry. The exclamation mark. When we log in into DNA, we see all these five different tabs, design, policy, provision, assurance, platform. Every single tab has a meaning and has a role and has a function. For instance, if you go to platform, all of my APIs are here, APIs are here. We can push APIs to Catalyst 9 case. We can push APIs to other devices which support the capability. We can create a custom APIs for northbound integration. I look at design. This is where we create hierarchy. Policy that we're going to work on. Provisioning of a device. And then assurance. So every tab is important. Don't think these tabs are there just for no reason. Every single tab is extremely important. So what we're going to be doing today, we will create a hierarchy and we are going to create a wireless LAN controller integration scenario into the environment. So we're going to start with, right now, if you see here, we have five different continents. And then within North America, we have Canada, Mexico, USA. Within USA, we have California, New York, Texas, Washington. What I want to do, I want to integrate provision and assign a wireless line controller to Chicago campus. The very first step, remember what we talked about. We have a hierarchy here, global, to North America, to USA, to the states. I'm going to create a state here, Illinois. You see, on the bottom right, whatever I'm doing, you are going to see everything on the bottom right. Changes in progress, once it's done, you will see it on the bottom right, it is pushed successfully. Now we have a state of Illinois. As I said, I want to talk about our Chicago campus, Cisco Chicago campus. I'm going to add a city called Chicago. Side edit successfully. Now I go to my Chicago campus. Within Chicago, I can go ahead and add the building. So we are going to add our Rosemont campus in this building because this is where Cisco office is and that's what we are going to do here. Now, as I were to start typing the name, you guys will see that DNA is going to start filling in. It has geolocation enabled by default, which shows us as we are typing the address, it will give us suggestions. So I'm going to give this name Chicago 5, this building. Now I'm going to enter the address. As you can see, as I'm typing the numbers, it is trying to guess where this might be. Now it says, if I can scroll down, I can see there are different suggestions available. And it does look like the Rosemont address is probably different now. So we can still go back and we can see by just entering the street number here, where it might be. So the different ways how we can do it or if you're unable to figure out, we can just put the latitude and longitude in here. So for instance, if I go to Google here and I search for Cisco, Chicago, Rosemont office. So this is the address that it shows here. Now if I go back here and let's 
right here. This time it picked it. So there are two different variations, but we want to pick Rosemont. And as you can see, the moment I picked the address, it showed me latitude, longitude, and exactly where that office might be on the map. So we're going to go ahead, hit add. Now every single time when we come into Chicago and I select Chicago 5, it will show me the intersecting streets where exactly it might be. And this is where it's very important if we have multiple campuses across the country or across the globe, and we have DNA Center, which is tracking everything and monitoring everything, we can see exactly where they are on the map. Now, we have added the campus. What we talked about in the previous slides, in order for access points to provision and integrate, we have to have a floor. So I'm going to add a floor here. I'm going to call it first floor. It asks us, do I want to add the floor plan? For now, we're just going to go ahead without it. And once it's done, we can always do it later on as well. We can always go to edit, and we can edit the floor plan. We can actually add the image again. So if you don't have it for now, we can still move forward and we can come back. We can make changes to that. We can still do it. Now, the very first thing, in order for access points or in order for a fabric-enabled wireless and controller, we all have to understand how the access points will integrate and how the SSIDs will get propagated. So we are going to create network profile first. What we are going to be doing is creating a network profile for our corporate SSID for the Chicago campus. We're going to go ahead, add a profile here. And since we are talking about wireless only, we're going to add a profile for wireless. I'm going to name this profile Chicago campus. Add an SSID. I'm going to go ahead, add an SSID. My SSID is corporate. Now, here we can see we have a fabric option here. If you notice here, the SSID can be fabric enabled or it doesn't need to be fabric enabled. There are different options available. This comes from the customer requirements. Which, X, which SSIDs do, do they want to be part of the fabric? Which SSIDs do they not want to be part of the fabric? So understand from customer perspective. Show them how everything can be done from the fabric, whether it is fabric enabled wireless or it is over the top provisioning. Now we have created our profile, we have created an SSID. Let's go ahead and hit save. And profile edit successfully. Now if we go down, we should see our Chicago campus somewhere over here. Now the missing piece, as we discussed, everything has to be assigned to a campus. We are missing it right now. So I'm going to go ahead, assign North America, USA, Illinois, Chicago, and I'm going to assign it to my first floor. That's what I'm going to do here. Select, and right here, I have a site now. Now, provision. What provision does? It provides two main functions. One, it assigns devices to site, whether wired, wireless LAN controller, or an access point, or any other device. It assigns those devices and binds them to a site. The second piece it does, which is very critical, is provisioning. These are the two main functions that the provision tab has. It has other features as well, but these are the two main components and main functions. So in our case, we are looking for a wireless line controller. Campus underscore wireless line controller is what we have. Right now, this is not assigned to any site. So what we will be doing here, we will be moving it to Chicago now. So I will be going forward with assigning it to Chicago. So it was assigned to San Jose. I'm moving it. It has been moved to Chicago. Now I need to move it, assign it to Chicago campus. 
So I will go ahead, I'm going to assign it to the floor. I can assign it to the campus or I can assign it to the floor. Make sure when we assign access points, the access points has to be either equal to the wireless line controller or a subset of the wireless line controller location. So apply, assigning device, and you can see the device is now successfully assigned to a location. So once that piece is done, we're going to go ahead and do the provisioning. We can also filter a device by name. If I want to go ahead and say campus underscore WLC, I can create a filter, apply it. I will see my device immediately. And you can see here in the site, when I hover my mouse over, Illinois, Chicago, CHG5, first floor. Now the last piece is I would have to provision. Assigning a site doesn't do anything unless you do the provisioning. When we do the provisioning, what happens with the provisioning? That is the key component. It pushes all of the DHCP settings, NTP settings, any AAA config, or any of the other shared services that we have defined in our design. Provisioning will push all those policies and all those settings to that particular device, whether it's a wide, it's a catalyst, or it's a wireless line controller. This is going to be an active wireless line controller. This is the summary here, and we're going to deploy. So you can see here all the network settings here. NTP server, AAA primary, AAA secondary, client information, DHCP, SNMP, domain name. This is the kind of information that it pushes out. The SSID that we created, so you can see what it is pushing out as we are doing the provisioning for the device. Go ahead, hit apply. It is validating the config and the deployment is in progress. So that will conclude part of the demo here. Now, yeah, once it is done, you can see it has, the device has become managed and provisioning status is successful. If we click on the details, we can see the success. We can click on the details. It will show us step by step what it has done. So with that said, that will conclude our first webinar. What we talked about in this webinar is why SDA. We talked about what it brings to the table. We talked about the, the solution components. We talked about how everything comes together. We talked about what are the important pieces. We talked about what are the key things that we need to remember when we are having conversation with our customers. Here's the link on the screen and the use cases that we are presenting. And it has instructions on after you log into dCloud, what you need to search for and how to log into the demo DNS center. And you can follow along yourself. With that said, I will give it back to Salman. Salman. Salman, you are on mute. Sorry about that. I was talking on the mute. So I think uh, this is perfect. Um, uh, great job, uh, Omer. I think uh, we are good with the first uh, webinar. So we'll come back on Monday, and then basically we'll follow through the module, complete the module three, which are the remaining two demos, followed by module number four and now module number five. And uh, looking forward to see you, seeing everybody uh, back on Monday. So we will share today's content. Vic will share today's content um, uh, for all the attendees. And once we come back on the um, on Monday, we'll uh, complete the webinar number two and then uh, basically and share that content as well. Appreciate everybody uh, joining in and looking forward to seeing yeah. you on Monday. Thank you. Yes, it's Salman. So thank you. Um, thank you very much, Umair. Outstanding work, guys, uh, today. Um, so, folks, uh, for, for those of you listening, we are indeed going to take over again on uh, uh, go to part two on Monday. 
uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern. You should have all been uh, gotten notifications via email uh, from CVENT that uh, with the updated webinar information. I, today, I already posted the PDF of today's session uh, into the partner community. I put that in the chat, uh, so all those links are there now. Um, and then, uh, as uh, there are a few questions that are sort of still unanswered, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, ask the panelists to go back and, and examine those questions. Uh, I, will, uh, I will copy those, uh, and then we will also post the Q&A for today. We'll anonymize it and post the Q&A for today in the partner community once all questions have been answered. So thank you all for attending, and uh, have a great, uh, great uh, weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Joe, you can stop the recording, sir.